What begins on page G7 are four types of synovial joints. All right, so uh, the, uh, there are four types, and the first type we mentioned last time is the least important of them. Uh, it's called a limited movement synovial joint, uh, and uh, it means exactly what it says. Uh, it may be a synovial joint, but there's not a lot of movement that is permitted between uh, the two bones. Where do we find this? Between the carpal bones of your wrist, between the tarsal bones of your ankle. All right, don't worry about it, not a big deal. But the second category is a big deal. Uniaxial movement synovial joints. By definition, that means that they allow movement in one axis or plane. We're going to give you two examples, uh, two types of uniaxial movement joints. The first are called hinge joints. Yes, we mentioned them last time. They allow flexion and extension. This is movement along one axis or plane. How do they get the nickname hinge joint? As I mentioned last time, it kind of reminded the anatomist of just like a door swings open and shuts. That's kind of like your elbow, your arm moving at your elbow, or your uh, a leg, lower leg moving at your knee. So uh, these are the most common of all synovial joints. That's what we wrote. Uh, they include not only the elbow and the knee, but between your, the uh, uh, joints between your phalanges both fingers and toes, they allow flexion and extension. Uh, this picture, you'll remember, just shows the elbow joint area. We are reminded that there is a whole bunch of ligaments that totally encircle the bones and hold the bones together. It's called a fibrous capsule. If we uh, look on page G, uh, G9, G9, uh, there is one... Uh, a uh, hinge joint that I want to spend a few minutes on, and that's the knee joint. The knee joint is a very important joint to know about. This is page G9. So why is the knee joint so important? So uh, right down here, it's important because the knee joint is the largest joint in the body. It is the largest joint. Secondly, it is the most complex joint. And thirdly, it's the most commonly injured joint. It's very common, here I'm probably trying to see what I wrote, it's a very commonly injured. I'm going to explain more about why it's the most so commonly injured, how it's injured, in, uh, in a few minutes. But first, let's take a look at the knee joint. The knee joint. Uh, first of all, this, if, if this is the femur right here. Femur. The distal end of the femur. This is, of course, the tibia and the fibula. Let me remind you, the tibia is medial. Remember TM? So the medial bone of the lower leg is the tibia. That's supposed to say medial. Uh, the fibula is, of course, lateral. If you're looking at your own lower leg, uh, the tibia is the medial bone, the fibula is the lateral one. Let me also remind you that the femur only attaches, only articulates with the tibia, not with the fibula. That makes it different than at the elbow, where the humerus attaches to both the radius and ulna. This was something we pointed out when we were learning the skeletal system. It's an important difference that pe most people don't realize that there is that difference. Now, the first thing that's unique about the knee joint is that there are ligaments in the center of it. Uh, we know there are ligaments around the outside of uh, uh, the bones to hold them together in a synovial joint, but here we literally have ligaments in the inside where the synovial cavity is. Now the ligament running on the front is famously called the anterior cruciate ligament. It's 
boxed in. It's anterior, it's on the front, uh, and it is well known. If you haven't heard of it, then you're not paying attention because this is torn all the time. This is a very common injury, is a torn ACL. That's what they'll call it, ACL for anterior cruciate ligament. There is a ligament right behind it called the posterior cruciate ligament. And the, how they get the name cruciate is cruciate means cross because they kind of form an X or a cross. There's a, a town, a city in New Mexico called Las Cruces, which means the cross. So uh, cru cruciate means to cross. So uh, the, of the two, it's usually the front one in front, the anterior, that's torn more commonly than the posterior. Now, another unique feature of the knee joint is there are pads of fibrocartilage uh, that are located within the synovial joint. These, uh, they are labeled here the meni medial meniscus and the lateral meniscus. A meniscus is a pad of fibrocartilage. It's made up of fibrocartilage. The toughest type of cartilage. What's the purpose of uh, this meniscus? The meniscus acts like a little shock absorber or pad within this knee joint. To act as a shock absorber or cushion. You might remember that uh, there are similar fibrocartilaginous pads between your vertebra called intervertebral discs. They're also made up of fibrocartilage and their purpose is a shock absorber. <clears throat> Now, uh, so those are unique features, and as we're going to see in a moment, it is very common to tear the meniscus, especially the medial meniscus, and when that meniscus of fibrocartilage is torn, they commonly refer to that as torn cartilage in the knee. So if you've ever heard that expression that somebody had torn cartilage in their knee, that's what they've torn, is that meniscus, usually the medial one more than the lateral. All right, and then finally, of course, uh, there are ligaments on the outside of the knee joint to hold the bones together. Now, it's not shown here, but of course there would be a kneecap, a kneecap or patella right here in the front. It's not shown. The patella or kneecap protects the knee joint from injury. And there is a ligament, it's labeled right here, a patellar ligament that really goes right over goes right over the front surface of that kneecap and uh, it runs along the front side uh, to hold the femur and tibia together on the front. All right. There's also ligaments, a whole bunch of ligaments, but just two more that I'm going to mention. There's a lig ligament running along the uh, medial or tibial side and it's called the medial collateral ligament the medial collateral ligament. The medial collateral ligament. <clears throat> it uh, runs from the femur to the tibia. That's why it's also known as the tibial ligament. It's also called the tibial ligament. You'd say, well, how, how am I going to remember tibial or medial collateral TM? The tibia is on the medial side. That's why it's called the medial collateral or tibial ligament. There is a ligament running on the, along the lateral side that runs from the uh, femur to the fibula, and it's called the lateral collateral ligament. The lateral collateral ligament. It's on the lateral side. <clears throat> there are a whole bunch of others, but these you should know. These you should know. All right. W why is the knee? We mentioned here it is the most commonly injured joint. The knee has a big problem. What's the problem? Of, you, you'd say we all have problems. What's the knee's problem? The problem that the knee has is it has to be flexible enough to allow us to run and to jump, and yet it has to be strong enough to hold the weight of our body. 
You don't have to hold up the weight of your body with your shoulders, but your knees have to hold up the weight of your body. The most common knee injuries are related to the following. Uh, somebody is running and they pivot real sharply. They turn real sharply. You'd say, well, like, I never do that. Well, you do if you play basketball or soccer or football, where you're uh, running with a ball or you're kicking a ball in soccer and you make a fast turn because somebody's trying to take the ball from you. So when you turn, there, you put a lot of torque or turning pressure on this knee and the most common thing that happens is this ACL pops, it tears. The second thing that happens, and I'm going to write it down for you in a moment, is the medial meniscus can tear. And the third most common injury is the medial collateral ligament tears. So what are the three most common knee injuries? I'm just going to write them right here on the uh, middle of the page on the right-hand side. The three most common knee injuries in order. And of course, if you're wondering, could somebody have all three? The answer is yes. You could have a, you know, a, a world, you, you could have a home run and, and destroy everything, all in one injury. So the most common injury is a torn ACL, anterior cruciate ligament. If you follow sports, I can almost guarantee that if you listen to the sports news for one week, some famous person or other in, who plays basketball or football or soccer, it will be reported, has torn their ACL and is out for the rest of the season, maybe the end of their career. Uh, the second most common injury is a torn medial meniscus. That's that fibrocartilaginous pad right here on the, on the medial side. And the third most common injury is a torn uh, medial collateral ligament. It's known as the medial collateral or tibial ligament. Those are the uh, order. And you'll notice that because of the what usually causes the injury, this outward turning, this lateral turning movement, uh, the, what especially tends to get torn are structures on the medial side of the knee. Any questions on the knee joint? Yep. I, when I tore my ACL, I didn't have it in place because I, I, I was freaked out about having a, a donated thing. That's right. That, let me just explain. The way if somebody tears their ACL, what they usually do nowadays is they use a cadaver ligament and they screw the cadaver ligament in to where the ACL should be. Now you might say, well, why do you need it? This is holding your, knee, uh, your, your femur to your tibia. So literally, if, you don't, if it's torn, that whole knee thing is loose. Uh, I'd be walking down the street, and then all of a sudden I'd just be on the ground. I'm yeah, it's happy. literally, that's how unstable the knee becomes. And it also hurts a lot. Gotcha, so uh, it, it's absolutely essential. So that's what they do is they take a uh, cadaver ligament. Okay. Uh, so much for uh, on G9. On G10, let's summarize a few points I just said. So what's the function of that meniscus of fibrocartilage, which we just talked about? Uh, it increases, the, it acts like a cushion. It's a cushion between the femur and the tibia. After all, when you jump up in the air and you land on your feet, uh, you want that little cushion of fibrocartilage between your femur and your tibia to cushion uh, the, uh, the when you land. Uh, the function of the cruciate ligaments is to hold the uh, femur and tibia together and to limit flexion and extension. You know, all of us can bend, flex, and extend our leg at our knee. No one can hyperextend. If you can hyperextend, the whole thing is unstable. <laughs> And what prevents it from hyperextending are those cruciate ligaments. So they limit the flexion and extension movement. Now, when somebody injures their knee, there is a buildup of synovial fluid. That's called water on the knee. 
So if you've ever heard that expression, somebody has water on the knee, that means they've injured their knee and there's a buildup of fluid. That, that happens wherever, wherever you injure your body, anywhere. It tends to have a buildup of fluid. Uh, going to torn cartilage, what's that? That's a, a, a torn meniscus, usually the medial meniscus. So if you've heard somebody has torn cartilage in their knee, what they mean is the meniscus has been torn. And then, what's a trick knee? A trick knee is where that meniscus has been torn and it moves around. When it's in the right place, you can bend your knee. But when that meniscus moves out of where it's supposed to be, the knee locks and you cannot bend it. That's called a trick knee and then it'll go back into the right place again. Is that what you have? So the, the, they have to obviously remove that cartilage because it's moving around in there and every time it moves out of place, it, uh, the knee locks and you can't bend your knee. All right. The, uh, the, we've been talking about the knee as an example of a hinge joint, a joint that allows flexion and extension. There's another category of uniaxial movement joints. They are called pivot joints. Pivot joints. Now, a pivot, we've used uh, examples before. An example of a pivot joint is between the atlas and the axis, where you can rotate your head laterally to the side or bring it medially back to the midline. This is also movement in one axis or plane. It's just that rather than allowing flexion and extension, it's associated with medial and lateral rotation medial and lateral rotation. So that's called a pivot joint. All right, the third type of synovial joint. You say, how do we get to third? There was the limited movement synovial joints, there was the uniaxial movement joints, and now, number three, the biaxial movement synovial joints. As their name suggests, they allow movement in two, bi, bi means two, bicycle has two wheels, two planes. So uh, there are many examples of these. Uh, let me use the example first of, uh, say, the wrist, uh, the radiocarpal joint. Uh, you can flex and extend, right? You can bend or straighten at your, uh, at your wrist between your radius and ulna, your, your lower forearms and the wrist, joint, uh, wrist bones. That's waving bye-bye. You can also go move from side to side. Uh, if you know Italian, so you say basta. Basta means enough in Italian. So this is a side to side movement. So uh, at the uh, uh, wrist uh, joint, there is both flexion and extension, and uh, uh, we might call it abduction and adduction. Moving your arms, uh, uh, hands away, uh, and two, abduction and adduction. Uh, another example, I'm not going to go through all these, another example is the TMJ. We have somebody who's in pain with their TMJ right now. The temporal mandibular joint. So that's at least a biaxial movement joint. Some people even say it's a multiaxial joint. How is it biaxial? You can certainly move your jaw up and down, at least if it doesn't hurt. All right? So we call that elevation and depression, raising it and lowering it. But we can also move our jaw, our lower jaw, from side to side. Can you do that? Now, of course, it may be in pain. And in fact, the TMJ, uh, uh, so you're not alone in having TMJ pain, because approximately 5% of the U.S. population has TMJ problems. So one out of every 20 people, one out of every 20 people. Now, we've talked about this before. The TMJ problem could be pain, uh, and I assume yours is periodic, not chronic. Is it chronic? No. It's just periodically it acts up on you. Some people have, uh, where every time they open and close their jaw, it makes a noise, it clicks, it's not supposed to. Is that what yours does? Or? No, it, yours it. does? It's not supposed to. Uh, some people grind their teeth, as, even when they're asleep at night. These are called TMJ problems. 
and exactly how they solve it depends upon what the problem is. So uh, that's the TMJ. It is a, a, it's very common to have problems with it. It is one of the easiest joints to dislocate uh, because it's not, we've talked about that before, there's not a lot of muscle to protect it and a strong hit right in the jaw can pop it right out of its socket. So uh, in martial arts, one of the moves, defensive moves they teach you is to take your, the palm of your hand and shove it right into somebody's chin as hard as you can and it'll literally dislocate their jaw. So, uh, all right, that's the TMJ, the uh, temporomandibular joint. The fourth and last category of synovial joints are called multi-axial movement synovial joints. And the example we're giving of that are ball and socket joints. There are two ball and socket joints, and yes, we've talked about them before. These are the most movable joints in the body. The single most movable joint is the shoulder, where the head of the uh, humerus fits into the glenoid fossa, or glenoid cavity, of the scapula. This allows 360 degree circumduction. That's called a ball and socket joint. Another example at the hip is where the head of the femur fits into the socket called the acetabulum of the pelvis. That also allows circumduction or 360 degree rotation. Not quite as movable as the shoulder, but in both cases, it does allow 360 degree rotation or what's known as circumduction. These are called ball and socket joints. They are multi-axial. They are the most movable joints in the body. Any questions on that? So we've covered four categories of synovial joints. The main one I talked about was the knee joint. Uh, on, um, on page G11, on G11, this is, just reminds you that the, how the atlas sits on top of the axis and it allows lateral and medial rotation for you to go no. Uh, and here's the uh, TMJ, uh, just reminding you of how the uh, temporal mandibular joint works. On page uh, G13, on G13, on G13, this is the uh, ball and socket joint at the hip where the head of the femur fits into the acetabulum of the uh, pelvis. That's a ball and socket joint. Uh, okay, as I try to do with each topic we take up, I try to look a, a little bit at some of the pathologies, some of the disorders that can occur. So uh, first, uh, congenital disorders. What does congenital mean? With birth. We learned that when we first used that term for skeletal problems with birth. So uh, now double jointedness is not really a pathology. Uh, and furthermore, we know it's a misnomer. What's misnomer mean? Misnamed. People don't actually have extra joints. What they, we said is that some people can hyperextend their fingers. Who can do that? Right? Some people are like bending their fingers way back. Right? There's a good example right there. They don't have extra joints. Their ligaments that hold their bones together are looser than the rest of us. So that creates greater mobility. But it's possible they could dislocate a bone easier as well. Another, a, a, a real pathology, one that actually we learned about when we talked about the skeletal system, is congenital hip dislocation. We said this is more common in women. This is where the head of the femur keeps slipping out of the socket, out of the acetabulum, because it didn't form properly during embryonic development. So the person walks like this. You probably have seen that. So uh, that's called congenital hip dislocation. Uh, OK, the uh, uh, mechanical injury, what's a sprain? A sprain is an injured ligament an injured ligament. The most common sprain you're familiar with is the sprained ankle.
when you sprain your ankle, this is where you're walking and you inadvertently take a step and put weight with your foot turned inward. What's the term we use if your soul is turned inward immediately? Inversion. So if you put your weight with your foot, rather than having your foot, the sole land on the ground, on the floor, instead you put the weight of your foot on a turned foot. And so you put the weight, and that, then you're limping like this, because you've sprained your ankle. The whole thing swells up, and you've actually injured a ligament that runs right along the lateral side. So it's quite painful, and it takes, uh, it can take several weeks to heal. Uh, a dislocation is where the bones separate from, uh, at the joint. They're dislocated. They also use the term luxation, which is called a dislocation. In the uh, x-ray that you see at the right, can you see where the dislocation is? All right, it's right here. Does everybody see it? So it's between what and what? The dislocation, well, the dislocation involves which specific phalange? It's a phalange. It involves the middle phalange of digit number three. Is that right? Remember how we name these? This is the, these are metacarpal bones. These are phalanges. This is the middle, proximal, middle, and distal. So it's the middle phalange of digit number three. What are the most common bones that are dislocated? The most common are finger bones. So finger bones, phalanges. Those are the most common, uh, commonly dislocated. Uh, it can also include the thumb. Uh, and uh, it can also include the shoulder, where the head of the humerus pops out of the scapula. And uh, uh, it can include the temporal mandibular joint. Those are probably the most common. You, especially the finger bones. Yeah. So you say you're like hiking in the wilderness and it happens to your buddy. What do you do? Do you like try to I don't know if you do anything. You try to get back to where there's somebody can look at it because they want to take an X-ray to see exactly what's wrong before you start moving it around. Yeah, yeah. Just, just stabilize it, and uh, and you know, use the your duct tape. All right. But the idea is, yeah, just you don't want to move things around because you don't know exactly what's happened. I mean, if you, somebody really, really knows and they can feel, maybe you could try setting it. But uh, unless you really know, you really want to take an X-ray first. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm not going to talk about bunions. But uh, on G15, I'm sorry, G14, on G14, I want to speak briefly about arthritis. Arthritis. Now, the word arthritis literally means inflammation of the joint. There are more than one type of arthritis, and I'm going to talk about three different types of arthritis. Uh, the three types are rheumatoid arthritis, number one, at the bottom of the page, gouty arthritis, known as gout, and on the top of G15, osteoarthritis. So what's the difference between these three types of arthritis? The first type, rheumatoid arthritis, again this is G14, is this is an autoimmune disease. This is when the person's own immune system attacks their joints. It is more common in women. And in fact, many autoimmune diseases, for some reason, are more common in women. So as the immune system attacks the joints, uh, it causes disfiguring. And in this x-ray, is very revealing just some people who have had rheumatoid arthritis for years, they're in chronic pain. They cannot open up their hands. They are basically become permanently deformed, and it's in chronic pain. Uh, one of the approaches of treatment is to give 
corticosteroid drugs. Why corticosteroids? Because, as we've mentioned previously, corticosteroids are uh, immunosuppressant drugs. They suppress the immune system. They suppress the immune system. So they may put them on corticosteroids. They may or may not. May not. All right. Uh, another type of arthritis where the joints become inflamed is something called gout or gouty arthritis. Now, many of you have heard that word gout. It's just that you have no idea what it is. Well, this is a metabolic disorder. The word metabolic means biochemical. In this biochemical disorder, which is probably genetic, uh, the person develops high levels of uric acid in their body. This is called, a condition is called hyperuricemia. Hyper means high. Emia means what? In the blood. In the blood. So what is there a high levels of in the blood? Uric acid. Uric acid, which is actually shown right here. This is uric acid. Now, uh, what the heck is uric acid? Uric acid is a waste product formed from the breakdown of old nucleic acids. So old nucleic acids, let me just say nucleic acids, Nucleic acids are converted in your body. They are converted in your body into uric acid. And uric acid is normally excreted in your urine. But in these people, they have very high levels of uric acid that are formed. And this uric acid tends to accumulate in their joints. The uric acid precipitates or accumulates in their joints. And one of the joints that it seems to accumulate the most commonly, and we don't know why, is it accumulates in the joints of the big toe. So especially it accumulates, the uric acid accumulates and irritates the joints, especially the big toe. All right, so uric acid accumulates in the joints of the big toe. So it causes it to swell up and it hurts a lot. Now it's not limited to the big toe, that's just a classic place where it occurs. Now, uh, what do you do for it? Uh, the kind of drugs they give, and I'm not going to test you on it, is they give a drug that reduces the formation of uric acid. The name of the drug is allopurinol. I'm not going to get into it. You don't, certainly don't have to know that. But the point I'm trying to make is that the drug, I think it's allopurinol, but anyhow, uh, the, the name of the drug, the type of drug, is totally different than the drugs used to treat rheumatoid arthritis. Now, one other comment that I want to make about gout. Some of you have heard that people who have gout should not eat a lot of red meat. Has anybody ever heard that? Yes. So why? So let's remember what red meat is. Isn't red meat skeletal muscle? Red meat is skeletal muscle. <laughs> so you'd say, okay, so what? All right. Well, it's skeletal muscle. So what that red meat is skeletal muscle? We have learned that skeletal muscle, we've covered this, we, we covered the microscopic structure, skeletal muscle cells are unusual. What is a unique feature of skeletal muscle cells that are different from most other cells in the body? They are multinucleated.
So skeletal muscle is multinucleated. So you'd say, so what? So what kind of chemicals are in the nucleus of a cell? Nucleic acid. acids. So, uh, and what are nucleic acids turned into? Uric acid. So if somebody is eating a lot of red meat, they are eating food very high in nucleic acid. And since nucleic acids are turned into uric acid, this is going to make this problem worse. I want to emphasize, eating red meat is not the cause of the problem. But eating red meat makes the problem worse because it increases the load of nucleic acid in the person's body, which is turned into uric acid. And that's their problem, is too much uric acid. You follow that? So that's because the, 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 the so it's high, the mus uh, muscle is high in nucleic acids. High in nucleic acids, and which are turned into uric acid. All right, the third and uh, last type of arthritis that we're going to talk about on page G15 is osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis. Now, osteoarthritis is really most commonly due to repeated, it's caused by repeated injury, in repeated trauma. Trauma means injury to a joint. So this is caused by repeated trauma or injury to a joint. So because it's caused by repeated injury, this is especially common in athletes. Because athletes repeatedly injure their joints. They're very hard on their bones and joints and muscles. That's what they do for a living. They play football, they, they play soccer, they play basketball, and they're aggressive players. And when they injure their joint, any normal person, after they injure it, would be go really easy on their joint that's been injured for months or years and they would not push their body. But that's not true with a professional athlete. A professional athlete who's injured a joint takes pain medication, anti-inflammatory drugs and is playing the next week. So with repeated injury it becomes chronically inflamed. Chronically inflamed and it deteriorates. The joint breaks down from repeated injury. Uh, the way the, the medication that these people take are usually non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, uh, such as, uh, for example, uh, ibuprofen. All right, uh, let's, uh, just about the last topic here are bursa. Now, most of us haven't heard of a bursa, but we may have heard of something called bursitis. So what are bursa? Bursa, I wrote, are synovial filled, synovial fluid filled sacs. And our first thought is, what? So uh, let me draw a very simplified picture of a bursa. A bursa is a sac It's a sac. The outer part is fibrous connective tissue. So there's a fat a sac of fibrous connective tissue. On the inner lining of this sac, there is a vascularized membrane. So there is a vascularized membrane. You'd say, what does the vascularized mean? It have, has a lot of blood vessels. So here's this vascularized membrane with a lot of blood vessels, and it's called a synovial membrane. Now you might say, well, didn't we learn about synovial membranes for synovial joints? And the answer is yes. So this is also a synovial membrane. And we've learned that synovial membranes, these vascularized membranes, form fluid. So that this accumulates, this sac fills up with fluid. The 
this is called, this is synovial fluid. And you're probably saying, I can't read what you wrote. I wrote synovial fluid. <laughs> I wrote synovial fluid. I don't blame you for saying I can't read it. So that fills up with synovial fluid. So this is like a little sack filled with fluid. That's how it, well, the, why it's called a bursa. You'd say, well, what do you mean? Well, that's why it's called a bursa. The word bursa is Latin for purse. It's like a little purse filled with fluid. Like a little handbag with, uh, filled with fluid. Now, what's the purpose of this fluid-filled sack? The purpose of it is to act like a little cushion against friction, to reduce friction. Now you'll notice right here, this is showing the elbow. This is the back of the elbow, and here is a bursa, a fluid-filled sac. This is known as the olecranon bursa. You'd say, I don't get that. Well, your elbow is the olecranon process of the ulna. And there is a little sac between the skin and that bone, the olecranon process of your ulna, and that little fluid-filled sac is called the olecranon bursa. Now, that bursa can become inflamed. And if it becomes inflamed, that's called bursitis. And this would be a cause of what's known as tennis elbow. It's another cause, where because of the location. There are also, so what is bursitis? Bursitis, we wrote, is an inflammation of the synovial membrane in a bursa. Now, uh, uh, if you look on G16, the next page, on G16, this is a cutaway side view of the knee, and there's a whole bunch of bursa. There is a bursa right in front of your kneecap, right here, called the prepatellar bursa. I'm not, I'm not asking you to remember its name. I promise not to ask you the name. All right, but that's a fluid-filled sac. The purpose is to reduce friction, but it can become inflamed. That would be called bursitis. There is another bursa, another bursa right up here called the suprapatellar bursa. You do not need to know the name. There is another bursa down here called the infrapatellar bursa. I'm not going to ask you the name. So there are a whole bunch of these fluid-filled sacs to reduce friction between moving parts of your body. Now, uh, if you take a, a fast look at G12, uh, G12, on G12, this is the shoulder. I know, it looks like a mess. But you will notice it points to a bursa here called the subacromial bursa, another bursa here called the subdeltoid bursa, there are a number of fluid-filled sacs in the shoulder. I'm not asking you to remember those names. I'm not. Any of these bursa, first, what's the purpose of them? They're a fluid-filled sac to reduce friction. But any of these fluid-filled sacs can become inflamed. What's inflammation? Have we ever covered the word subject of inflammation? The answer is page G, I'm sorry, D8. D8, we originally learned about inflammation. Redness, warmth, swelling, and pain. So if you've forgotten what inflammation is, go back to D8 in histology. So any part of our body can become inflamed, including these bursa, and that would be called bursitis. It happens to be that the most common bursa that get inflamed are these in the shoulder. So the most common site of bursitis is shoulder bursitis. So if you know of anybody who had a lot of pain in their shoulders, and what do they do? They give them an injection of a corticosteroid. You know, they'll say a cortisone injection. And that reduces the inflammation. So back where we were on G15, so let's just make a note. Uh, they are especially common, especially common in the shoulder. Bursitis. 
And they have various nicknames. Uh, there's something called, oops, housemaid's knee, and tennis elbow, and postman's heel. That's just where the bursa is located, if it's right here in the elbow, if the bursa is, that's inflamed is here on the kneecap, uh, if it's on the heel. Uh, so then they, that's where the person feels a lot of pain. Okay, the very last thing for uh, section G, uh, as we wrap that up, are synovial tendon sheets. So our first uh, question is, what? So let's, let's first of all see where there's some tendons. What I'd like you to do is to move your fingers and look at your wrist. Can you see things moving in your wrist? You see that? Those are tendons of muscles, and they are moving. They're sliding. You can see them. Now imagine if you were typing very quickly. That's a lot of movement, isn't it? So the, surrounding the tendon, this is a tendon right here, is a fluid-filled sac. So here's the tendon, and there is a fluid-filled sac. And this fluid-filled sac surrounding the tendon creates a, uh, basically some fluid around that tendon to reduce friction. Now, what's the structure of the sac? So there's an outer sac of fibrous connective tissue. This is a sac of fibrous connective tissue. And on the inside of the sac is a synovial membrane. There's a synovial membrane on the inside. What does the synovial membrane do? It secretes fluid. Synovial fluid. So there's synovial fluid surrounding the tendon. Now what does this remind you of where you've got a, a sac with a synovial membrane secreting fluid? Bursa, just like the bursa. But in this case, this fluid-filled sac is surrounding the tendon. So we call this a synovial tendon sheath. And so why do we call it that? Because the, uh, there's synovial fluid around the tendon. Some people say that this looks like, uh, this thing here looks like a hot dog inside of a hot dog bun. Right? So here's the hot dog bun, here's the hot dog inside. Anyhow. So uh, uh, the purpose of this is to reduce friction. Nevertheless, when people do have movements rapidly, chronically, all the time, just like a bursa can become inflamed, it, meaning it becomes red and hurts uh, and swollen, so can this become red and hurt and sw swell up. And uh, when that happens, there's many names for this. This could be called tendonitis. Tendonitis, inflammation around the tendon. Uh, it uh, also goes under the name repetitive motion disorder. And when it's found around your wrist, it's called carpal tunnel syndrome. So cashiers who at least in the old days had to go and, you know, all day long, eight hours a day, day after day, you know, punch in uh, the cost of different items. Today they scan them, but they used to. So they would develop chronic pain in, associated with these tendons, and that was called carpal tunnel syndrome. So uh, remember that a lot of injuries are because people are doing something all the time. So uh, if you, uh, it, it, most of us are not going to develop tennis elbow because you play tennis. If you play tennis at all, you play it once a week. But what if you're a professional tennis player where you are exerting tremendous forces every day on your elbow? So they tend to develop these repetitive motion injuries. Right? That's what they're due to, repetitive motion. All right, so much for Section G.